we can see that uh, our audiences are now joining in. I think the meeting in the other room has finished. So thank you for your uh, patience. And uh, we'd like to start the session now. So uh, this VISIS high-level dialogue uh, will focus on multi-stakeholder partnerships driving digital transformation. And multi-stakeholderism has been at the heart of the WISIS process since its inception. Um, all, we, I see many familiar faces. It's really nice to be with the uh, WISIS family. Uh, and the IGF and the WISIS forum are always occasions to get together, uh, to renew our vows, and to work together uh, uh, to make sure that we are building an inclusive knowledge and information societies. So I see our uh, uh, gender trendsetters here. Uh, welcome. I see several prize winners. Uh, you're doing a great job at the grassroots level. It's so nice to see you. Uh, Balzur, our friend from Bangladesh, uh, many others. Um, also, uh, our UN partners, FAO, UN Pension Fund, and so many of you here. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, also, th a big thank you to the Japanese government for uh, organizing this and for um, actually helping us uh, materialize this session, which we had in mind since a long time. So thank you very much, sir, for making this possible. Uh, while we are waiting for uh, our Secretary General, Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, uh, maybe we will move on to the video message by Mr. Utsumi, who was the former Secretary General of uh, ITU. He was very excited about this session, but unfortunately could not join us today due to some reasons. So if I'd like to please invite the logistics team to play Mr. Utsumi's uh, video. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to give a speech at this session. I organized two phases of the World Summit on the Information Society, this is in Geneva and in Tunis, as the Secretary General of the summit. The summit was originally proposed by Tunisia at the ITU Kyoto Plenipotentiary Conference in 1994 just three decades ago here in this conference hall. It was only one year after CERN had released WWW for commercial use and only a limited number of people had started using the internet. Therefore the proposal was quite abrupt and awkward to most people. So the plenipotential conference couldn't make a decision on this proposal. By the way, I was the chairman of this plenipo. Four years later, I was elected as a secretary general of ITU. At that time, many people had started using the internet and ICTs had become a key for the business activities. I thought it is a good timing for world leaders to discuss the potential of ICTs. Therefore, I recommended the ITU Council to hold the summit, although I had strongly hesitated, because no specialized agencies have succeeded in organizing a UN summit. It was a too heavy responsibility for ITU. But the Council, without studying much, easily accepted my proposal. The preparation of this was extremely difficult and challenging because ITU had no resources for it. Furthermore, Tunisia and Switzerland competed to host the summit, and each of them insisted its hospitality. It took many months to obtain a compromise. It was a unique summit of two phases. I thank Tunisian and Swiss governments for their strong support for the summit. WISIS was very different from other UN summit. First, it was organized by a specialized agency, not by UN New York. I'm very proud of the fact that WISIS is 
only one UN successful summit organized by a specialized agency. Second, it are two phases with many preparatory conferences and regional and sectoral meetings. Third, it introduced a multi-stakeholder approach for the first time in UN summit. These three unique features have shaped all the business process and post business activities, even today. I think they come from the very nature of the information society itself. First of all, it was quite technical. Therefore, ITU, a specialized agency that dealt with ICT's initiated the process. Second, the information society is a comprehensive arena where everyone is included. Therefore, much stakeholder approach was taken and every UN organization was involved. And last but not least, the information society was quite a new concept that not all people shared at that time. The March stakeholder approach could guarantee the participation of all the players that make up the information society. The two phases with a tremendous number of preparatory meetings could make people share a common concept of the information society, could enlighten world leaders about the importance of ICTs, and could make them commit to building the information society. A small specialized agency, ITU, requested other UN agencies to participate in the process, which facilitated the creation of an implementation mechanism. It was this heavy, complicated organization that could make possible the success of ULYSSES. However, it led to inefficiencies and it required lots of time, energy, and money. The first phase of the summit achieved a common understanding of the key principles that will determine our ability to harness the potential of ICTs. World leaders shared the vision of a people-centered development-oriented and inclusive information society where everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. They recognize that education, knowledge, information and communication are at the core of human progress, endeavor and well-being. They recognized further ICTs have an immense impact on virtually all aspects of our lives. The rapid progress of these technologies opens completely new opportunities to attain higher levels of development. The capacity of these technologies to reduce many traditional obstacles, especially those of time and distance, for the first time in history, makes it possible to use them for the benefit of millions of people in all corners of the world. The agreements in Geneva were numerous, but the essence was as follows. Recognizing the importance of ICTs, the world leaders ensured that by 2015, more than half of the world's inhabitants have access to ICTs within their reach, connect villages with ICTs and establish community access points. To that end, 11 action lines were identified. The outcome of Tunis was that the world leaders reaffirmed their agreement in Geneva 
and renewed their commitment to building the information society. And they confirmed that much stakeholder implementing implementation should be organized, taking into account the 11 action lines in the Geneva Plan of Action, and should be moderated or facilitated by UN agencies. They offered a list of facilitators or moderators. They agreed that ITU, UNESCO, and UNT, UNDP should play leading facilitating roles. They agreed to enhance the existing financial mechanisms for the ICTs, but they couldn't agree to establish a new one. Concerning issues on how the Internet should be governed, they couldn't agree and decided to continue to discuss it through a newly created forum, the Internet Governance Forum. Two decades have passed since then. We all look forward to seeing ICTs open new opportunities. Are we now in the world we envisioned? I think that the wishes go to connect people to the internet by 2015 has been achieved. At WISIS, we implicitly imagined that we would be connected by optical fiber. However, thanks to technological progress, mobile networks have realized the access to the internet down to the individual level, surpassing the WISIS goals, such as connecting villages. Therefore, as far as the connectivity is concerned, we can say that we have realized the basis goals. Of course, I know ITU, Her Excellency Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, is working hard to help people left behind. The issue of the data divide is still a big challenge. The driving force that made African leaders commit to building the information society at Mises was a hope that with the help of ICTs, developing countries left behind could leapfrog the government. And this potential for ICTs to achieve their hope was reaffirmed at the 2015 SDG summit and big progress has been made since then. Yet, poverty and turmoil remain. We must work hard to make the best use of the potential of ICTs for the higher levels of development. It is also difficult to say that other basic principles confirmed at WISIS, such as freedom of speech and free flow of information, have been fully realized. In more specific domains, such as uh, data divide, capacity buildings, security, and cyber crimes, much progress has been made thanks to the effort of the facilitators and stakeholders. However, there remains many issues to be solved. As a whole, I don't think that we have realized the commitment of Mrs. to build the information society. Furthermore, many new problems not anticipated at that time have arisen, such as smartphone addiction, fake news, and election interference. As ICTs have been used heavily for intelligence activities and weapons, the scenery of modern battlefields has completely changed. And recently, the rapid development of AI is becoming a menace to humans. AI is a double-edged sword. While we may get many benefits from it, 
Some critics say that it may damage human creativity and could lead to the disruption of mankind. Once humanity has enjoyed the benefit of ICTs, it cannot live without them. The problems are complex, diverse, and global. Some of them we have discussed for more than 20 years, and we understand the issues quite well. But others are very new. Humanity has never experienced them before and they cannot be easily solved by one government or international organization alone. For new challenges such as generative AI like ChatGPT, on which we do not share common understanding, I believe we should make the best use of the multi-stakeholder approach so that each stakeholder can share the nature of the issues and participate in the problem-solving efforts. On the other hand, for issues such as cyber crimes, privacy protection and security, where problems have become clear, we should avoid open-ended fruitless discussion. Although we have been tackling these areas for years in various ways, we should take a more effective organized approach that is focused on problem solving. Relevant organizations should work intensively with clearer mandates and qualified experts. They are expected to play a greater role. We have already experienced for 20 years the mechanism for the post vicious effort. I think it is time for us to review them in terms of efficiency in accordance with the nature of the issues. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude my speech by expressing my belief that with our effort, the commitment made by world leaders at MISIS are bearing fruit and we will soon see a people-centered, development-oriented an inclusive information society in which everyone has the means to express their ideas and be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Utsumi-san. Uh, we really miss you here uh, today. We wish you could have been with us. Uh, that was a wonderful video that took us through all the memories and the entire timeline. So you can see that uh, the spirit, I don't think you'll be disappointed with us because the spirit of cooperation and multi-stakeholderism, which was the, uh, the heart of the VISIS discussions, uh, even at that time, uh, it still remains. So thank you very much. And participants, just to let you know that uh, Utsumi-san has made this video on his own. So that was an incredible effort. So thank you very much, uh, Utsumi-san, for all your dedication towards this session. Uh, I'd like to remind you that we also have remote participation. So there are uh, many WISIS stakeholders who have joined us uh, remotely today. So thank you very much. For some, it's really early, uh, and for some, very late. But they are all there due to their commitment towards the process. Um, without any further delay, I'd like to uh, invite our Secretary General, the Secretary General of ITU, Ms. Doreen Bogdan-Martin, to please uh, provide her keynote and opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Gitanjali. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and, and gentlemen. Um, thank you for being here, and uh, special thanks to the government of Japan who is uh, co-leading this session today. Uh, it's kind of a tall order to follow Mr. Utsumi. Uh, I loved those photos. Uh, it was sort of a walk down memory lane, as many of us in this room can remember. Uh, of course, we haven't aged since then, right, Henriette? <laughs> Um, but it was uh, really a, a nice recap of what happened and how and why, and also good to get his sense of actually what, uh, what we have achieved. 
Um, so I'm happy to be part of this session today, which focuses on something that is really important to me, one of my kind of key priorities, which is partnerships. And of course, it's about multi-stakeholder partnerships to actually drive digital transformation. So look forward to hearing from our brilliant panelists. Um, I have just come from another session looking to the future of the WISIS process, and it kind of ended with where I think we're, we're sort of picking up here, which is the interlinkages between the WISIS and, of course, the SDGs. And I think the goal for all of us is that we achieve that 2030 agenda. Uh, we achieve those 17 goals, and we know <clears throat> that the 2030 agenda is not on track, and we believe uh, that leveraging the WISIS process, leveraging the IGF community, uh, leveraging digital technologies, we can achieve those SDGs. Uh, Rob and I were together in New York uh, a couple of weeks ago where we launched our um, SDG digital acceleration agenda, where we demonstrated that 70% of the targets can be accelerated if you actually use digital technologies. So I hope we can get into that today. Um, we, uh, of course, are at that halfway point, uh, as the DSG of the UN uh, said repeatedly throughout um, the high-level week. Uh, it's half time. We have to win it in the second half. And of course, it's going to take all hands on deck to actually win it. Uh, and to win it, we need strong multi-stakeholder partnerships. Um, when we look, of course, at those SDGs, they do carry the hopes, they carry the dreams, the rights, and the expectations of people everywhere. Um, and I think that's, that's really what happens. Um, that, that will, that, that's what we're up against if we don't uh, get the SDGs back on, back on track. And I think uh, with, with our work here today, we can make progress. I think it's fair to say that the WISIS uh, has been a sort of hotbed of collaboration, collaboration that brings together governments, uh, UN organizations, other international organizations, the private sector, academia, and of course, civil society. Uh, each year at the WISIS Forum, we celebrate uh, great achievements. We have our WISIS Prizes, uh, which is always something very exciting uh, for us, and Katanjali has the, the leadership in that process. And we, we see sort of firsthand how technologies can empower women and girls, how technologies can help connect those rural villages, how the latest breakthroughs in AI can help to detect breast cancer, and of course, much, much more. And I think it, it really shows the power of digital to impact lives of people and livelihoods. Uh, so again, I think 2030 is our litmus test, and failure, I think for all of us, is not an option. So I urge you to roll up your sleeves, work with us, let's partner, let's get it done. Join us next year, where we're going to be back to back with AI for Good at the WISIS Forum, and I'll let Gitanjali share more details about that later in the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doreen. Yes, indeed, we look forward to welcoming all of you from the 27th to 31st of May uh, in Geneva for the WISIS Plus 20 Forum High Level Event, <laughs> which will be held in the same week as the AI for Good uh, uh, summit as well, which Doreen uh, had mentioned. So um, now we'll move on to our uh, panel discussion. Uh, we have a multi-stakeholder uh, panel to give us different perspectives. Uh, they, we've divided it into two parts because we wanted to include as many voices as possible. Uh, so the first uh, question to this panel would be um, around the topic of identifying achievements uh, and gaps in the implementation of the WISIS process in these 20 years, the WISIS action lines in particular for achieving the sustainable development goals and developing a common uh, vision for the future beyond 2025. So, uh, Doreen, I'd like to invite you to uh, provide a context around this uh, and then we'll move on to the uh, uh, panelists. Thank you. So, if I look to achievements, 
I think we can kind of proudly say that, okay, only a third of humanity is not connected. So we, we made a lot of progress since 2003, but that only third of humanity is also a gap that we must address. Um, I think it's also when we, when we look to this issue, let's keep in mind what happened during the pandemic. I think the pandemic put, di put digital technologies on the top of everyone's agenda. The pandemic is behind us, hopefully for good. Um, but let, let's remember those lessons and let's, let's keep digital at the top of agendas. Um, and you know, because of the pandemic, we actually had in the course of one year, uh, we call it the, the COVID connectivity boost, we had 800 million actually come online during that period. That never would have happened. Uh, so we don't like to say thanks to the pandemic, but we recognize because connectivity was a sort of lifeline, it happened. So let's put that urgency in our work so that we can actually get out there and connect those unconnected. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen, uh, for setting the scene for this uh, topic. And I'd like to first invite Excellency Mr. Uh, Hiroshi Yoshida, Vice Minister uh, Japan, uh, who is the co-organizer of this uh, event as well. Uh, Mr. Yoshida, uh, in your opinion, uh, what have we achieved and what are the real challenges and gaps that we really need to focus on? Thank you, Jitanjali. Um, I'm very happy to join you here. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you to Kyoto. And uh, it is a very great season. Unfortunately, today it is raining. But uh, yes, uh, you can, I think uh, you can um, en um, enjoy the very beautiful scenery and uh, traditional city of Kyoto. Uh, having said that, uh, yes, uh, regarding WISIS, uh, I think that one of the significant fe features of uh, WISIS is uh, the point that uh, they set the uh, WISIS action line. Uh, of course, uh, we, we know that uh, WISIS action line, we all know now, but uh, at that time, uh, uh, everyone didn't know what we should do, and uh, the, we knew at that time what we should do not just at that time, but uh, in the mid term and long term. So that uh, um, every stakeholders all over the world knew what the, the um, issues we should challenge and what is the goal we, we, we should aim at. And um, so every stakeholders uh, um, made actions from, of course, uh, the, the process at uh, seeds are different and um, the way of doing it's different. But uh, um, everyone had the same common goal. That is a very important point. And um, so as, uh, as Mr. Utsi mentioned, um, so there are many achievements, uh, including uh, um, building, uh, uh, I'm sorry, bridging a digital divide or um, uh, capacity building and uh, so improving of uh, application or services. And uh, so that in that process, uh, this IGF forum is, uh, had played an uh, uh, important role and um, for multi-stakeholder discussion. <coughs> and so that uh, I, I believe that IGF had uh, enlightened uh, um, with this process and um, we so we we have up to now made a great uh, uh, achievement. On the other hand, it is often pointed out that uh, still 2.6 billion people are remained unconnected, and um, so um, every every country, every and every other stakeholders also ITU had a very hard work had made a very hard work uh, to achieve this uh, uh, issue, uh, achieve this goal to uh, tackle a uh, digital divide, but uh, it still remained. And um, so what we should do now is to introduce um, 
new, new technology. As you know, mobile technology uh, allowed leapfrog from, for many countries uh, to let, the, uh, let people connect it. And also, we have ad other technologies, including a non-terrestrial network. And uh, th those technologies can be an effective way to um, connect in the rural areas. And uh, so that we, we should not hesitate to introduce uh, um, new technology. Um, so we, 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 we are going to have a VCS plus 20 review in 2025. And uh, so it, it was very important to know what was discussed in very in the very beginning of this research process as a uh, uh, thanks to Mr. Utsumi uh, but uh, so we 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 should take that uh, background of what is a, a starting point in, in our mind and uh, but of course we should go look forward so that uh, technology is advancing changing very very rapidly in this field so that um, uh, we so introducing those uh, new technologies, we, we should uh, still um, go further to achieve this service uh, action line. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yoshida-san. And also for reminding us about the VCIS action line frameworks of the 11 action lines that still remain a very important uh, framework for global digital cooperation. Uh, thank you very much. We'd now like to move on to Excellency Mr. Nezar Ben Neji. He's the Minister uh, of Ministry of In Information and Communication Technologies, Tunisia. Uh, everybody knows that Tunisia uh, had the vision of the VCIS uh, process and initiated it by a proposal in the ITU's plenipotentiary in 1998. And uh, this is how we are sitting here today. So uh, thank you very much for the role that Tunisia has played in the process. Uh, so Minister, what are the specific actions that we still need uh, to take to achieve the WISIS goals? And uh, what are the main role uh, of the governments all around to increase confidence and security in the use of ICTs? Over to you. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you for these two questions. And I would like also uh, to, um, to thank uh, the uh, Japanese government for the hospitality and uh, for the good organization of uh, uh, this ev event. I'm really happy to be with you in this uh, session. Uh, regarding the specific uh, actions, so uh, I think we need, uh, at this moment, we need the global effort in order to reduce disparities, uh, especially in the use and in the development of the uh, IT and the ICT in, uh, in general. And uh, we have uh, several levels and uh, we can say several factors of uh, these disparities. The first uh, one is about the ICT legislation. So we need to, to have a complete, modern, uh, coherent and up-to-date uh, ICT legislations at uh, at national uh, level in each uh, country, in order um, at the beginning, in order to well develop the ICT, uh, the ICT sector, and also in order to not block the new in the new initiatives and to not block the new forms of technological uh, development. So we need uh, major efforts in order to update our uh, ICT legislation. The second uh, level of disparity is about the development of the uh, ne network IT and telecom infrastructure. So in many countries around the world, uh, uh, we have wide, uh, rural, uh, wide, white, white areas, not well connected, not well served with the, with the, um, the IT infrastructure and also with the uh, IT services. Uh, since it requires a huge investment, it requires financial resources. So we need to, um, to, to help uh, countries to in order to well develop their IT and telecom uh, infrastructure. And the third level or the third point is about the digital uh, illiteracy. So regarding the digital illiteracy, so this is mainly the inability of uh, people to benefit from the ICT, uh, from the ICT services. 
uh, and in many countries around the world they don't have good education where to teach and to teach people how to use smartphones how to use internet how to benefit from the ICT uh, services in uh, in uh, in general so i think we at this moment we need major effort in order to uh, address these three challenges so we need to update the ICT legislations for each country to not have uh, these disparities between countries, regions, and continents. We need also to well develop the IT and telecom infrastructure and to benefit from all kind of um, types of uh, connections, wired, wireless, uh, satellite connections, and also we need to spread the digital uh, culture, and also we need to teach the digital uh, skills for, uh, for ev everyone. And regarding the second question about uh, confidence and uh, and the trust uh, about ICT and in, in the cyberspace in general. Um, so let's say we, we have t 10 layers of, uh, of trust and 10 layers of uh, uh, c confidence that we need to, to build and we need to set in place. The first one, we need to, um, first one, we need to recognize f at, at the beginning the digital content, the digital documents. So we need to have uh, the legislation and the legal framework to recognize, for example, the electronic transaction, the electronic invoices, uh, the electronic identifications. And then at the second level, we need to, at the second level, so we need to recognize the electronic proofs, uh, like, like si digital signature, like for example, time stamping. Uh, and at the third level, for example, we need to uh, have a legal framework for homologation and for the technical pr improvement of the software and hard hardware solutions, either imported or developed uh, locally at the national uh, level. And also we need, at the national level, also we need to set in place a uh, framework in order to organize, in, to organize the, the, hosting, uh, the hosting services, the especially the cloud service providers. For example, in Tunisia, we have recently set in place a labeling framework in order to, to give two types of label, G cloud label and N cloud label, in order to organize the hosting capabilities the hosting services at the national level. Also, we need to think about trust at the network le level because we need to consider always trust when we select operators, when we select providers. So we need to consider trust at the network uh, level. Uh, after that, so we have the digital services or the electronic services. So we need to have specific legislation for each sector, for e-health, for telemedicine, for e-commerce, e-gov. And also we need to protect the consumers of the electronic services. And we need to set in place also uh, a legal framework in order to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to periodically control the security of the electronic uh, services. And in case of incidents, so of course we need uh, national computer emer emergency, uh, emergency response teams. And in case of cyber criminality, we need the legal framework for, uh, the, for the incriminations of the cyber attacks and for the uh, sanctions and for the digital investigation. So we need a stack of rules and a stack of operators to intervene at each le level in order to build the trust from the electronic documents to the uh, cyber criminality and to, to the sanctions of the cyber uh, attacks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, we look forward to working closely with Tunisia uh, in the review process and uh, uh, we do know that you'll be a strong voice in the vision beyond uh, 2025 as well. So thank you very much for your guidance and your vision. Uh, we'd now uh, like to invite Mr. Rob Opp, the Chief Digital Officer of UNDP. UNDP is a very close partner of uh, the implementation process. ITU, UNESCO, UNDP implement the WISIS process in coordination with more than 32 UN agencies. So, uh, Rob, it's a pleasure uh, uh, to have you here in our panel. Um, so, my questions to you would be that uh, what are the key priorities for us uh, for uh, WISIS beyond 2025? And how can we ensure that WISIS remains relevant and impactful in the years to come? Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Gitanjali. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, um, despite the jet lag. So I'm going to do my best to be articulate, if I can. Um, I think your second question, which is how do we ensure WISIS stays relevant. Um, I think Doreen, you spoke to this uh, a bit already. I think the key to this is really aligning with the SDGs. Um, 
and other processes that are going on right now. We have a big year coming up for digital discussions. The Global Digital Compact as part of the Summit for the Future is a major milestone for the world when it comes to digital. And the SDGs at the midway point represent an important inflection point for how we need to accelerate with using ICTs and digital technologies. So I think the key to relevance is to make sure that we're aligned with these global processes um, and supporting and driving the way WISIS has been doing over the last two decades. Um, I think in terms of priorities, uh, I would make a few observations, um, maybe a little bit more general in nature based on our experience as UNDP as we uh, encounter and, and dialogue with our 170 partner countries, uh, many of them on the digital transformation efforts they're making. And one of them is that we still see a lot of fragmentation when it comes to the use of technologies in countries themselves. So ministries will be very fragmented between each other. There's a lack of a whole of government approach. There's not always a lot of whole of society thinking. Civil society and other stakeholders and private sector are not well integrated. And so what we at UNDP try to do is support our countries in thinking through what does a whole of society approach look like? So um, not just what individual solutions. So it's really moving from solutions to systems, or in the case of digital ecosystems. Um, and I think that is also important for this, the second uh, issue that I would flag, which is we're starting to see the importance of truly interoperable and open systems coming into play. So for example, the digital public infrastructure, um, I would say movement that is emerging, and this is um, due in part to India's uh, recent leadership in the G20 on this issue. And it's kind of evolving the concept that has been at work in a number of countries over the last uh, decade or so at least where countries have been realizing that the right combination of technologies with the right interoperability, the right systems thinking, and the right governance around that can really unlock the uh, ability for governments to lay down the kind of infrastructure, the sort of digital roads and bridges, and for the private sector to be able to innovate on top of that. Um, also leaving the roads open for civil society and others to participate. So we really think that this interoperability, this openness, the, the notion behind digital public infrastructure is another issue that I think we can take forward in the WISIS platform. And maybe the last thing I would say is that I think that WISIS needs to really double down on the people-centered approach. Um, it, we must understand how, I, I think the original action lines, you know, paid attention to some of the issues around the information society and po potential negative effects. But uh, as um, Mr. Otsumi said in his video, we're starting to see some really important trends emerge that are really quite negative for humanity. And so we have to understand that everything we do with technology has to be accompanied by the right governance and the right people-centered approaches. And this includes, for example, the safeguards that need to be in place. Um, and related to that, very important, as um, Minister Neji just said as well, is the issue of digital capacity. Um, because we're not obviously going to be able to get to a point where people, where, where the work that we do with technology is people-centered unless people are really actively able to engage. They understand what their rights are. They understand how to engage safely and meaningfully with the connectivity and the government systems and the societal systems that are available. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Rob. And of course, uh, keeping in mind the entire digital ecosystem, very important. Also, the digital finance component, which uh, we have been talking about also in the SDG Digital, which was highlighted by ITU and UNDP. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to move on to um, Anirat, uh, the Senior Advisor on Internet Governance, Policy, Advocacy, and Strategic Planning, uh, APC, Association for, for Progressive Communication. Uh, Anirat, uh, 
and APC have been associated with the VISIS process, also right since its inception, bringing the voice of civil society uh, into the process whenever needed. Um, so Anirat, uh, my questions to you would be again, uh, what are the, some key achievements in your opinion uh, that the framework of the VISIS action lines have brought in the past 20 years? Uh, of course, the gaps. Uh, and you had a very interesting uh, session yesterday about uh, the gender uh, inclusion to GDC. So how do you uh, look at that, uh, also the GDC and the WISIS uh, process moving together? Uh, over to you. Thanks, Gitanjali. Um, I really think the, the importance of the WISIS actually strikes me year after year. And I think it just shows you how often one feels that a process that you've invested in might not have achieved enough once member states have agreed on the final sort of small print. But in fact, I think in the case of WISIS, it has proven to really endure. And that's why I think, uh, you know, what Robert and others and Doreen have said about updating it. I think why it's so important and why it provided a good um, framework, um, um, even though not all the goals have been met, Gitanjali, is that it combines overarching principles, people-centered. I absolutely agree with Robert on that. It's one of the strengths of, of the WISIS, human rights, um, and then the principles of participation. And I don't think we've had anything else that has actually been as strong on bringing those overarching principles together. And then it combines them with the action lines. And therefore, it creates a framework when you, as civil society, are collaborating with government or holding governments accountable. Sometimes governments update policies in ways that are not so good, and that's the role of civil society. Um, WISIS creates a framework where you can actually engage in a specific field such as access to health, public health, um, agriculture and food security, media freedom, at a very specific level, e-governance as well, while also putting on, it on the table uh, considerations around the rule of law, respect for human rights and inclusion. And I think there are very few frameworks, with, even within the UN system, that brings civil and political rights as well as social and economic development and economic, social and cultural rights together. And, and for civil society, which is immensely diverse, that's the strength of civil society, that it's so diverse, that also then creates a framework where you're going to have a very wide and, and diverse range of civil society organizations participate. I think the other strength really has been that it was focused on the positive potential of ICTs. And I'm not saying that we should not consider harms. Mr. Utsumi said that, others have said that. But I think we've now moved into a paradigm that is not only not people-centered, it's digital-centered, but it's also overly concerned with the harms and less with the potential. And this is particularly problematic because as Doreen said, a third of the world are not yet connected. And of those that are connected, many do not have meaningful um, connectivity. Um, I, I mean, I think just in terms of civil society participation, Gitanjali, I would agree that, uh, and, and you asked about gender, I think there is a need to rethink one thing in the Tunis agenda. And that's um, in their respective roles and responsibility. I think there was a vision within the Tunis agenda that came not from, 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 from member states, which reduced the role of civil society very much to being a partner in implementation, not necessarily a partner in policy making and, and shaping. I think civil society's role also needs to be at the level of policy making and then of course, at the level of holding states and other actors accountable um, for, for human rights, but also in implementation. So I think if we, we look at the future of the WISIS follow-up and monitoring paradigm, let's look at one where there's these different roles in different contexts, depending what's at stake, um, can be accommodated from the different stakeholders. I think updating the content is necessary. I think it can be done. I think climate change is extremely important. I think financing and gender. And I think the WISIS framework gives us the granularity to be able to update it without having to come up with a brand new framework. In the same way that, as Doreen pointed out in the earlier session, it, it really harmonized very well with the SDG framework. I think the GDC, the Global Digital Compact, I also see it actually reflected within the WISIS. I think the WISIS gives us a strong 
um, both at the level of broad principle and specific frameworks. And then I think finally I would just say that, you know, as we take this forward, um, let's work with the WISIS Forum, let's work with the IGF, um, the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, um, UNDP, bring UNDP even more into the process, bring the Office of the High Commission into the process. So, so this, this strong family of UN agencies that have been driving WISIS, I think, could benefit from bringing more, more UN agencies in, into the table. I think the, the working with the G20 process on digital public infrastructure is also an incredible uh, opportunity, as, as Robert said. And I think that we ultimately, and this is, will be my last comment, I think for civil society as well and, and, and for member states, um, let's not reinvent our, our forums, our, our processes. Let's improve, let's build on, on what we've achieved in terms of models for collaborative policy making and implementation. And I think what I would like to see most is to really use this notion of the WISIS principle of participation, of multi-stakeholder participation, as a mechanism for deepening and including more actors and, and doing it more effectively rather than as a brand. I think too frequently these days multi-stakeholder has become a brand rather than approach which has transformative potential. Thank you, Anuret, and uh, we really appreciate your support. We'd like to invite the panelists of the first round to please uh, uh, join uh, the audience and the panelists of the second round to please join us. Please do bring your nameplates <laughs> if you're with you. And don't need to stay. Yes, and request Secretary General to stay back with us. Uh, please do not leave panelists from the first round because we will come back to you <laughs> at the end. <laughs> so please take a seat. Uh, so uh, also recognizing the uh, so many civil society uh, activists and partners here in our session today, uh, which highlights the uh, uh, relevance of the process uh, among civil society members. So thank you so much uh, for being here uh, with us. Um, so while we are waiting for um, the second round uh, of our speakers to join us, I'd like to um, invite, of course, Doreen to please provide a context uh, and set the context of uh, this group. Uh, in this group, we are going to um, focus on strengthening digital cooperation so, of course, multi-stakeholder cooperation, um, global partnerships, and creating an accessible and equitable digital landscape for all, leaving no one behind. Amrabek, um, please join us here. You can take the seat. Our youth envoy, Amrabek, um, from Kyrgyzstan, please join us here. Okay, so thank you very much uh, uh, for accommodating uh, this change. And uh, we'd like to start with the uh, Vice Minister of Indonesia. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, Doreen. Okay. <laughs> Please go ahead. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so I was asked to just say a few words in terms of context setting. And actually, I think, Henriette, you, you said it better probably than, than, than I can. Um, WISIS is digital cooperation in action, I would say. And, you know, as you were alluding in the, the whole panel before, we don't really need to reinvent it because it, there's a framework there that we can build upon. Uh, maybe picking up again, Henriette, if we were to add in environment, finance, more gender. I mean, there are things I think that, that we can improve. Um, and it is a process, yes, that's multi-stakeholder, but it's also um, very much a, a working as one UN process. 
uh, of course, close ties with, uh, with UNESCO, with UNCTAD, with UNDP. Uh, we also have, I think, in the room, our friends from UNU. We have UNSCAP here. We have FAO, of course, DESA. We are working also very closely with UNHCR, uh, OHCHR, and I think those partnerships we will strengthen as we look to the future uh, of WISIS, WISIS Plus 20. And of course, we work closely with, uh, with the co-facilitators for the GDC, and thank you also, also for being here. Um, and I think it's important also to consider we do cover a range of issues. So be it from uh, healthy aging in the digital era, which is more and more of an issue, uh, to looking at digital service design, uh, tech entrepreneurship for women and youth. And here I just want to commend the IGF because you do such a great job in getting young people, as I commend the ITU Generation Connect young person who's here. But I think that's really important, especially as we look to the future, um, the future process, the future framework that we recognize, and we do include young people. Um, because at the end, uh, we want to ensure that no matter uh, what their age, their gender, their economic means, or location, that we want to bring the benefits of technology to everyone, everywhere. Uh, I think our task, um, what we would love to hear from, from this panel, is how we can find new, maybe, or more creative means so that we can double down. We heard from the previous panel, we do have to, to double down uh, to make these meaningful partnerships and to ensure that no one is left behind. Uh, we want to ensure uh, that the WISIS process, of course, is closely synced up with the GDC, the Summit of the Futures, and ultimately to shape a digital future that's meaningful, that's accessible, uh, Rob, you mentioned the, the skills piece. I think that's a, a fundamental piece that we need to, to strengthen. And of course, that it's affordable, trusted, and that we can access local content, which is something that's also come across in some of the sessions today. Back to you, Gitanjali. Thank you, Doreen, uh, for setting the scene. Uh, I'll move uh, first to uh, our Deputy Minister from Indonesia. Uh, and Indonesia is really uh, record-breaking entries to the WISIS prizes every year. Uh, thank you so much for that, for galvanizing action in Indonesia. We receive uh, so many that it's always very difficult for the <laughs> action line experts to, uh, you know, decide, uh, you know, on the different uh, winning winners. So thank you so much uh, for bringing the local action uh, into the process process and for uh, showcasing them every year at the WISIS Forum and the WISIS Prizes. So, uh, so my question again to you would be, uh, you know, where do you see this uh, process uh, going? Uh, what are the specific actions that need to be taken to ensure that everybody can benefit from the digital revolution? And how can we ensure that digital collaboration and partnerships prioritize needs and aspiration of local communities? Over to you, sir. Thanks, you. Thank you, uh, uh, Gitanjali and Doreen. Um, Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my appreciation uh, to the government of Japan for hosting IGF in this beautiful city, Kyoto. The choosing of the present IGF theme is not just timely, but also accurate in depicting our current internet solution and uh, uh, configuring the situations today. With the growth of the internet usage, our maturity, our perception, and our desire in responding internet has grown as well. So depending on who you are, where you are, when you started to use internet, your dream and vision on the internet will differ. However, such difference must not set us apart. To achieve such dream, allow me to address the questions on what are the specific action that need to be taken to ensure that everyone has access to the benefits of the digital revolutions. The actions that we need to take in Indonesia's views are first, 
the need to prepare our society for the future disruption as the result of the emerging technology. With rapid adoption of technology in business, we will see a lot of impact of the emerging technology in our daily life, not only from the threat of harmful contents such as disinformation, deepfake technologies that enable child pornography, but also from the economic side, such as disruption of conventional business model to online model, until the danger of losing jobs to working uh, automations. The second aspect involves establishing a level playing field within the nations. As digital transformation has risen, the, cre the creation of uh, a new competition ground Local and international players compete for market dominance within a country. Unfortunately, this dynamic often results in unfair competitions. While many see business competition is normal thing, I firmly believe that the advent of digital technologies should be harnessed as a potential catalyst. For fostering collaborative innovation that benefit all people, instead in the frame of competitions, um, I come to the third point that uh, this, uh, this condition should be enabled uh, for governance to support the interoperability of uh, internet utilizations. With the current complex dynamic within the internet ecosystem, marked by conflicting interests among stakeholders, it is imperative for countries to establish governance that are able to balance the diverse interests in technology utilization. To foster a conducive, secure, and mutually beneficial internet environment. And for the second question, how can we ensure that digital collaborations and partnership prioritize the needs and aspiration of local communities and avoid imposing one size fits all solutions. The answer in Indonesian opinion lies on the collaboration between different stakeholders facilitated by a specific platform acting as the pool of knowledge and the knowledge resource for policies and governance related to digital issues at multilateral level which we see an IGF could play such important, important role. However, we cannot stop there. Such platform must also optimize its unique feature as the platform for stakeholders to brainstorm policies and approaches that are tangible and impacting the society positively. Indonesia believes only through cooperation we can solidify our position, especially on digital internet realms. Let's work together hand in hand to enable collaboration that brings us closer to achieve the internet that we want. An internet that brings us a better life, not just for us, but for the next generation to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to now bring in Ms. Uh, Agne Excellency, Deputy Minister, uh, Ministry of Transport and Communications, Lithuania. Uh, thank you for being here with us, ma'am. Uh, so my first question is, uh, how can we strengthen digital cooperation and global partnership among stakeholders? And uh, what are uh, the challenges and opportunities, in your opinion, to create this equitable and uh, uh, e easy to access uh, digital landscape for all. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, as always, um, congratulations for Japanese government, for IGF, for creating such an amazing opportunity for us to be here. And of course, for Secretary General uh, Doreen Bogdan and ITU for raising those very important and timely questions, I would say, at the moment. So I would like to share with you several aspects from uh, Lithuanian side. Um, and first of all, I would say that we fully support current multi-stakeholder model when digital collaboration is based on truly cooperative approach. 
this is the model that worked well so far, and we are proponents of evolution in post-2025 with this process and not revolution. The word partnerships is instrumental here as it was mentioned uh, many times before today. Strong partnerships help uh, to Ukraine sustaining against the aggressors. Strong partnerships help implementing a number of digital projects such as Team Europe initiatives. And this is the way how Global North could and should help to reduce and close digital gaps in Global South. Another example uh, which I would like to mention and which comes into my mind in this regard is the ITU's initiative, Partner to Connect. There were over 200 pledges, uh, which all together will definitely make a huge impact towards meaningful connectivity and digital transformation globally. Another example I would like to mention is from the European Union perspective. Uh, we know very well how multi-stakeholder approach works in the EU. It takes months, if not years, to adopt any piece of legislation, starting from uh, impact assessments, public con consultation, commission proposals, and all other procedures. All these stakeholders play, or could eventually play, an important role in the process. Uh, therefore, we trust our legislation as it is uh, based on the strong involvement of all the parties concerned. And therefore, we see big potential in sharing our experiences with our partners across the globe. And um, touching upon challenges and opportunities in this regard, I would like to mention how it is crucial to identify long-term vision and common goals and ensure that all stakeholders share a common understanding of the goals and objectives of the collaboration and the vision itself. This alignment is essential for success. Um, Clear governance should also be mentioned. Uh, it is necessary to define roles, responsibilities, and decision-making processes within the collaboration. It seems we are on the verge of reshuffle, so we need to take into account our experience and lessons learned. This is our strength. And one very important challenge from my perspective uh, is possible digital gaps we need to avoid. Urban versus rural population, young versus old, gender divide, religion, regions, countries, ethnicities. Digital inclusion should be sustainable to about digital exclusion. And with new emerging technologies such as AI, it is rather easy to leave someone even unintentionally. We should think always uh, have this in mind and listen and consult others as many as we can. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Um, we'd now like to invite Ambassador Thomas Schneider, uh, Ambassador and Director of International Affairs uh, of Com Switzerland. Ambassador Switzerland has also played a very important role. Uh, Geneva Plan of Action was adopted in Geneva that provides the framework for the VISIS action lines. Uh, so what are your impressions, Ambassador? How have we done? Um, we did hear today that we we are not all that bad. We are working together to provide a safe environment uh, for a digital inclusive society. However, um, what can we do better? And uh, what's your vision for the uh, uh, co-hosted VSIS uh, Plus 20 high-level event we are doing uh, next year together? Your Ambassador. Thank you, Chitanjali, and uh, welcome all. I'm very happy to be here. I'm also very happy to uh, have seen uh, Mr. Utsumi. Um, because we were working very closely together with him 20 years ago um, when we were actually uh, at this stage in October, we were to well, like one and a half months before uh, a world summit with uh, tens of thousands of participants and also some high level people like presidents and others. So it was quite a lot of work um, back then. And uh, yeah, there are some fruits that we. There's, a, there's some trees that we planted there, and uh, there's some fruits that we that we can can build on. Um, with regard to to uh, two points that you highlighted in your question, the one is how to build trust, and the other one is how to to uh, integrate and 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 uh, prioritize the needs on on aspirations of local communities. Um, I'll try and and give you some some views on both because they are actually closely linked. First, on the notion of trust, 
often, often we hear like uh, titles of paragraphs in papers and in concepts and strategies about, about uh, fostering trust. And in, in my experience, trust is something that cannot necessarily be fostered. It needs to be earned. We can maybe foster trustworthiness if we look at ourselves as, as government or industry representatives. Um, because um, if we act trustworthy, then people actually tend to trust us. So, so we should act and work on ourselves mutually. And of course, um, different stakeholders need to uh, earn trust in different ways, according to, to the different roles that we have. As governments, or government representatives, or politicians uh, that are above people like me, for instance, um, we should try to actually do what the people want, focus on, on solving problems for our citizens, for our people, and not necessarily concentrate on, on staying in power uh, and, and pursuing our own goals as politicians, but actually, yeah, trying to, to listen to the needs of the people and, and do and help them to, to get what, what they need. Unfortunately, nowadays, um, we often witness actually that the latter is the case, and this does not necessarily add to building trust in political systems. Uh, with businesses, it's actually something like same, same, but different. Um, businesses, they want the trust of their consumers so that they buy the products, and also they need, of course, trust of society that they are perceived as good actors, acting responsibly, being competitors in markets, but sticking to rules, not damaging environment, not damaging people, etc. So also there, um, businesses try to um, be seen in a good light uh, by the consumers, by society. And uh, yeah, this is why we have uh, um, notions like corporate social responsibility or the new version of it that includes the environment, which is now called ESG, um, that you already uh, know all probably. Um, so uh, politicians spend a lot of energy to be seen in a positive light by the public as so do, uh, so do uh, businesses in the, help that they, in the hope that that will uh, give them trust or may make them trustworthy. And so this is where we come to the importance of a functioning and independent media system because people need tools to decide who they trust. So they need information that is reliable that they can then themselves decide who is trustworthy and who is not tr trustworthy. And of course, um, the development of the media and social media has given everybody lots of ways to express opinions uh, to influence other people's opinions, and this is why it is so important that we do have, no matter what the current latest version of, of, of media technology is, that we do have media that are not manipulated by those in power, but actually uh, in the hands of the citizens, and that allow citizens to, to enable themselves to, know, to decide who they uh, will be trusting. So um, this is something that brings me to the second point about the local needs. Uh, because also there, you need to have ways to communicate needs. So, um, first of all, people that live together on local level, they need to have processes that allows them to identify their needs, to discuss their needs, to set the priorities themselves. For this, again, you also need a public sphere where this discussion is possible. Then you, they need to have ways to make their voices heard. Again, you need uh, <laughs> processes. Then they need to have ways that their voices are not just listened to, but actually followed, that this is turned into political decisions. And from somebody that is coming from a country where um, we have something called direct democracy, where we do not just elect uh, politicians once every four years and then are subject to whatever they do, but we are invited to vote on all kinds of substantive issues several times a year. Uh, the answer to how to uh, make sure that decision makers actually follow local priorities and local needs is very simple through inclusion and participation. Inclusion in debates, in discussions, in finding out, in identifying needs, and then participation in political decisions uh, through participatory democracy, democracy models that again, of course, need spaces to discuss this on all levels. So uh, coming to inclusion, um, we think, and this is one of the, one of the definitely uh, let's say fruits of the WISIS is that in particular through this forum, 
this forum is one important channel to give voices to people that otherwise may not have access to be heard from all over the world. So this is a, a global uh, opportunity for people to make their voices heard from all stakeholders. So inclusivity is, is something, of course, that is at the core of the IGF. And at the same time, it's not just at the core of the IGF, it's also at the core of the institutions that were drivers of the WISIS process, i.e. in particular the ITU and UNESCO. Both institutions have uh, elaborated through the WISIS uh, a very intensive uh, multi-stakeholder culture, an inclusive debate in many of their processes and uh, both institutions are leaders to me in uh, fostering inclusive debates on digital issues, each of them in their own competencies that try to make all the voices heard. And uh, let me close with, with this, that um, given that the UN General Assembly, which is a purely intergovernmental uh, structure, will take the final decisions about what is going to happen in the UN uh, overall, uh, after the WISIS plus 20 review at the end of 25, it is even more important that institutions like the IGF, but also institutions like the ITU, UNESCO, and all other bodies that uh, think it is important to include all voices in their deliberations and in the policy guidance that they develop to include these voices. And so this is why we, of course, support and are very happy to be uh, a key driver in the WISIS plus 20 uh, process, in particular in this one uh, event that you uh, uh, highlighted, the, the next year's WISIS plus 20 uh, uh, high-level uh, forum uh, in Geneva, because we want to support all those that try to give uh, a voice to all those needs, all the people, not just the ones that normally have access to power and, and to media. So this is why we strongly support uh, the WCS Plus 20 process led by the UN, in particular by the ITU and UNESCO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Schneider, and uh, thank you for your uh, dynamic leadership and also guidance uh, to all of us uh, in, in this WISIS Plus 20 review process and the vision beyond 2025. Um, I'd now like to move on to Ms. Uh, Maria Fernanda Grazia, Grazia uh, Chief of the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, congratulations on your appointment, ma'am, and welcome to the WISIS family. <laughs> so ICC was uh, one of the main um, business voices uh, in the uh, WISIS process right since its inception. Uh, they have been supporting us to bring in the voices of business in each of the WISIS forums, the IGF, and the different consultation processes that we hold. Uh, so thank you very much for that, ma'am. And how uh, do you think we can work better better uh, to make the process more inclusive, to bring the attention of the private sector uh, to the WISIS processes, uh, to, to the UN processes, like the WISIS one, that uh, actually impact uh, the private sector. Uh, and also, um, you being the focal point for WISIS uh, over 20 years, how do you see the landscape uh, evolving uh, over the years, and uh, what are the ambitions of the private sector? Back to you. Thank you very much, and on behalf of the International Chamber of Commerce, which is the institutional representative of 45 million businesses in over 170 countries, I would like to thank the government of Japan for hosting us, and the ITU, Doreen, and all your team for organizing this panel. Uh, as you mentioned, ICC was uh, the focal business input in the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003-05 and continues to observe and provide input on behalf of global businesses in the wise as follow processes. And 20 years ago, this process envisioned the development of global people-centered information society where everyone can truly benefit from the enormous opportunities the internet, information, communication technologies, and digital transformation has to offer. This was a vision not only for the governance of the internet, but for harnessing its unique potential for inclusive and sustainable growth, helping populations everywhere to develop and thrive. 
Wises also made it clear that we have a shared responsibility in shaping the inclusive information society jointly cooperating across all stakeholders groups and find meaningful solutions to common challenges. As it has been mentioned, we have come a long way since 2003, but our greatest challenge still remains 2.6 billion people still unconnected. And we all know that it takes more than access to the internet to fully benefit from the opportunities it offers. An interoperable ICT ecosystem is crucial to offer truly meaningful connectivity that also includes access to services and relevant content available in local languages and the skills and capabilities to transform information into actionable knowledge. Governments alone cannot meet the investment needs and implementation challenges of expanding meaningful connectivity and with it, e-commerce capability. The private sector has been a pioneer and a partner in bridging this gap. And to continue an upscale business investment and enabling policy environment is fundamental. It is important that policymakers understand how the private sector makes investment decisions, as well as how political and regulatory decisions impact the technical functioning of the infrastructure or service. An enabling environment is not a catchphrase or an euphemism for the regulation or relaxing of tax systems or consumer safeguards. Uh, rules. It is substantially much more than that. Ultimately, an enabling environment is one that stimulates the necessary investment in a way that results in sustainable facility or service over time. This means a few things must be in place. First, a stable legal and regulatory environment that welcomes new entrants and recognizes ongoing development, values new forms of competitions, access to stable finance sources and rates that enable a sustainable return, and effectively promotes the common goals of digital transformation through education and skilling. Second, open markets and free flows of data across borders. Digital innovation could be crippled without cross-border data flows. Fragmentation and increased complexity caused by restrictions significantly complicate global value chains, creating burdens and market barriers, particularly for SMEs. And third, holistic whole of government approach to policy making. Policies should take into account the multi-layered nature of the digital ecosystems and consider economic, technical, sociocultural, and overarching governance factors. And last, but probably most importantly, a multi-stakeholder participation. Close cooperation with business and other stakeholders is beneficial to ensure that implemented policies pave the way for them to maximize opportunities while addressing issues that are relevant locally, respecting local culture and social norms. An enabling environment facilitates public-private partnerships in implementation of projects, but also considers the views of those required to implement policies from the first moments of policy creation. At ICC, we work with both the public and the private sector to create such enabling environments, ensure strong and meaningful uh, dialogues, and promote open and inclusive digital cooperation for the prosperity of people and planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And uh, now for our uh, special guest, the ITU Generation Connect Youth Envoy. He's come all the way from Kyrgyzstan, uh, Omer Bek. Uh, there was actually a competition amongst the Youth Envoys to, uh, and he won the competition to be represented here. <laughs> so uh, Omer Bek, uh, 
Congratulations. <laughs> and um, what role do you see of the youth uh, in the whole uh, process of mm. digital cooperation, you know, uh, ensuring inclusiveness and accessibility for young people all around the world? Um, uh, what what uh, are your views and what's the voice of the youth in this uh, regard? Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm a little bit uh, worried right now and happy to be here. Uh, thank you very much for such kind of opportunity. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Omar Bek. I'm from Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, uh, today I'm here to represent a Global Generation Connect program. Um, Generation Connect, all about um, young people like me, like you, like us, uh, who use the technology to change the world. Um, as we know today, uh, we have, as we know, 75% 70, of uh, all young people in the world, uh, they have uh, access to the internet. But at the same time, we should understand that um, in some parts of the world, uh, for example, in low income countries, uh, as many people, they don't uh, have uh, access to the internet. And um, today, uh, I think uh, young generation connect, um, we are uh, uh, solving this problem. I mean, uh, problem with internet, uh, with, connect, uh, with connection. And um, first, uh, first of all, I want to say that um, um, the, we should uh, give a uh, chance, we should give opportunity to young generation uh, to, to par participate, for example, such kind of uh, high-level discussion uh, and uh, this uh, such kind of conference. And uh, as we know, uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, young people, uh, they don't have uh, um, access to the internet, but uh, at the same time they have uh, really, really good ideas uh, to change the world. And uh, I want to encourage uh, encourage you to give a chance uh, to young generation um, to realize their ideas uh, and also participate in such kind of uh, con conference and uh, yeah um, the, the, la the, the last one uh, I'm I'm a little bit confused uh, just uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, yeah thank you thank you Umrebek and uh, uh, thank you for uh, also uh, delivering your talk in English, you you were not very comfortable, but you managed uh, and you did a great job. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'd now um, like to first of all give a, a big hand to the audience. Uh, Thank you all for being here and for uh, participating. And uh, we have uh, two minutes, so very, very quick, uh, I'd like to go through all the panelists just to say in one sentence uh, what they encapsulated as the vision for us and uh, what does WISIS mean to them. Just one sentence, uh, panelists, please. Is there a mic there? Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Rob. Thanks, Katanjali. Um, one sentence, uh, maybe just a phrase. Um, People-centered and multi-partner. Yeah, so, so I, I echo so human-centered approach and the multi-stakeholder approach. Thank you. and connecting communities. Thank you. Anured, Ambassador Schneider. Cooperation so that no one is left behind. Universal and inclusive. 
clear vision and balanced governance. Collaboration for better work. Um, can I make it a long sentence? <laughs> <laughs> like so much to say. So I'm going to say inclusion, and what I mean is like inclusive access. I think inclusive frameworks and I, whole of government, whole of society. Um, inclusive participation, picking up on Thomas's point. And I think also inclusive processes, meaning like avoiding the risk of siloing this from other UN processes, I think is so, so important. So inclusion and inclusivity. Thank you, Doreen. And with that, we close this session. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we will continue the discussion in the open consultation process meeting on the 11th. So uh, that will give you an opportunity to uh, interact with us. So we are not going to talk on the 11th, but we're going to listen to you. So please be there and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>